Hi, everyone. Welcome to the seventh episode of RevBytes. If you can believe it, we've been talking to you uh, or talking at you that long. Um, this <laughs> one is called Viral Volatility, Revenue and Distribution During the Eras of Uncertainty. It's something that Doug and I have been talking about a lot when we've seen each other at DARM and other you know, kind of conferences that are around. And, uh, you know, we're really happy to have you. Um, again, just as a reminder, uh, this is with your host, Doug Truitt, Head of Revenue Success at Reynolds United. Howdy. <laughs> and myself, John DeRolay, Revenue Management Expert at Wheelhouse. Uh, and we're going to be having a 20, 30, possibly 40 minute conversation about revenue and distribution topics in the vacation rental and STR spaces. So welcome to our seventh episode. Uh, today, we're going to tweak things a little bit. Um, we want to kind of get to the punch a little bit earlier on, and then we'll follow up at the end with our tradition of a joke KPI. Um, but I think what we really want to talk to you about that is becoming really relevant as we've come off a very hot summer in a lot of particularly U.S. markets. Um, things still seem to be pretty strong in a lot of places, but uh, we've started to see that markets are really um, adjusting. Uh, the situation around COVID and the global economy is changing. And um, that kind of volatility, I think, is something that is really important to address for both revenue management and distribution professionals. So yeah. the first really question is, is what are, what are we talking about when we talk about volatility? Um, Doug, yeah. if... Yeah, no, I think... It's, it's really interesting, as you said, like we've talked about in person conferences on just, you know, even just general talks, like what volatility is. And I guess by just regular definition of Google searching, volatil volatility often refers to the amount of uncertainty or uh, risk that's related to the size of changes maybe in a marketplace. Um, a lot of times if you Google search volatility, you'll probably see something of regarding like securities or like stock trading, that kind of stuff. But I think the, the same principle applies, which is, you know, what what, you know, how, how can we understand what's going to happen or what's not going to happen or, you know, what's there. And I think, you know, like echoing what you said, John, like a, a, a general feeling that I've had like going to some conferences now and, and seeing some folks in person and talking to people has been kind of like, I'm having the best year I've ever had. And it's just been such a great year for people in revenue and bookings. And, and there is a sense of feeling, um, that is kind of like a, maybe almost like a false sense of security that things are just kind of going to be great for, for a long time. But the reality is, is that I think a lot of folks in this going into the slower seasons need to start considering what potentially could happen. And there's obviously some some risks and some some factors that are out there um, that we'll get into more in depth about. But like, you know, COVID, what's that doing and what's that impact in and international travel and some other things in there. So, um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what volatility is and what we want to try to uncover and help people prepare I totally agree. I think generally, you know, when we apply concepts in the market, volatility itself is just uh, a lack of stability, a lack of consistency. In our industry, particularly, I think uh, a really good way for us to think about it, volatility is that um, near term historical trends or year over year historical trends are not a good indicator of future trends. Right. Um, because we have a little bit different time frames that we talk about than uh, other industries. Um, I think it's really obvious to us that year over year, things are not the same. And last year, year over year, things weren't the same. But I think right. also what we're starting to see right now is as we enter the kind of colder season in a lot of markets, um, we have uh, some, uh, you know, COVID this year is different than the situation for COVID last year. Uh, even our trends from a month or two months ago are not a good indicator of where we're going into this season. And because of the volatility over the last three years, our year over year data, even as far back as two years, is not, also not necessarily a good indicator of where we're going. So the question becomes, um, you know, what is it that we're going to be recommending? Um, we'll start with kind of this, but we'll delve a little deeper as we kind of talk through some of these issues. But from the revenue management side, I think it comes down to, um, it's up to us as, as revenue professionals in the space to build an expectation of what we think is gonna happen in the market. Um, probably isn't gonna be right, but you do wanna have an idea of what it is that we're, you think is gonna happen um, and how your strategy relates to that. And then build a plan B, even a plan C and develop a few key indicators that you can look at within your portfolio to see if you're actually deviating from your expectations so that you can know when to implement those plan B or C. Because at the end of the day, we don't really know what's gonna happen, but you can build some expectations and you can build some contingencies. In addition to that, I think a really big theme about um, going into next year, coming off this really hot year where seasonality has been super wacky, you know, shoulder seasons were high seasons, there were huge peaks, huge year over year development is, um, I think it's time to start educating your owners about, about what happened, 
in terms of seasonality last year and about what could happen next year. Because if the expectation is, is that this is the new normal, you're probably going to set yourself up to be in a difficult position with your owners um, or your own executive team. And there needs to be some conversation uh, at the forefront about like, hey, see how 19 to 20 was really volatile and then 20 to 21 was really volatile. Well, looking at what we know about this year, these are some things that could happen. If COVID goes all the way like it was last year through the spring, maybe summer in some of these shoulder seasons will be high seasons again, but maybe they'll also revert back to more traditional seasonality and just letting people know that that's something that they might expect is going to ease those conversations um, in the future, get build a lot of trust with your owners uh, and potentially avoid a situation where you're operating according to the market, but whatever your owner's expectations are based off of a, an anomaly over the last two years. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with all those. Um, I think, I think it's super important to really consider the potentials that can happen, not to, not to spook your homeowners or spook anybody about it. It's, it's, uh, kind of, I think like a little bit what you're talking about is, is almost just preparing folks to, to have the understanding that something could happen. And if it does, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of folks have, you know, I don't think they've intentionally left rates high or not, but there are some people, there's that term of, you know, uh, letting it roll kind of thing, leaving it on the table, keeping things high and keeping things there. And that does set up some false expectations for your homeowners because they're sitting there going, man, I've been making so much revenue. I've been making so much money. Yeah, this is great. And then in those homeowners' minds, they might be having expectations that they're going to do far better and exceed things going into the slower seasons than they usually have or are expecting or planning for next season to be as high and then start making budgets for themselves and things like that. And then you're leaving them in a place to potentially be really disappointed and potentially turn that against you. Um, so I think that's a really, really key and good, important thing to say, educating your owners and, and having that um, those plans, like you said, I think that's really great. I think from a, from a distribution side, um, in addition to that is, really making sure that you are considering, you know, channel diversification, um, you know, for maximum exposure and impressions. I mean, as you go into a slower season, or even if you don't know if it's going into a slow season or if it's, you know, a yeah, high season, whatever it is, with the uncertainty of volatility that potentially could happen on certain things, you want to make sure that you're seen everywhere you possibly can get traffic, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the traffic that delivers conversion on those places, but people search a lot of different channels and a lot of different things. So the more eyeballs you potentially have in the top of your funnel, the better chance you have at getting people to your site to get something. And if you have to drastically make changes to your rate strategies and plans where you trash rates or you, uh, you know, do something different where you, you minimize the amount of length of stay restrictions or do something like that, you want people to remember who you were when they were searching for things and potentially go find you directly or go find you and, and, and book you. Um, because when you make some of those changes in your unlimited channel, you know, channels or you're marking up channels really high or something and you're not getting seen as much, you don't have as much exposure to people to remember your brand and who you are. Um, you also probably need to start considering, you know, uh, you know, John and I, you and I were on a, on a webinar that you guys put on for talking about short-term, mid-term and long-term. Um, you know, those are the other areas that people need to start considering too. Maybe my business isn't a short-term business or my homeowner, homeowners aren't really uh, focused on short-term, but they've been focused on midterm. Maybe it's an opportunity to open up that discussion and create a plan around that that says, hey, maybe we should open up certain areas for short-term if we can, or the inverse of it. You're all short-term and you haven't really considered midterm or long-term very much. Maybe you need to start considering that because it might be an aspect that your inventory applies to. Those kinds of measures, I think, prevent, um, you know, risk and, and, and really hardships happening as severe as they might happen if something comes out of the, out of the woodwork, so to speak. Yeah, I think uh, if I was going to speak on two things, you kind of, I think that uh, I'd like to double back on um, some of the volatility can actually occur with what's going on within the industry infrastructure. So if you've been listening to our previous episodes, you've heard me being kind of a canary in the coal mine about Airbnb sh switching to a host commission model. Um, well, over the last two months, I've talked to a number of hosts who are being forced into that model, actually. Yeah. And so that's the kind of volatility in your own PL that if you're not at least aware of, could cause a significant amount of issues and may also uh, affect the way you have to interact with your owners. On top of that, I think when we start looking at um, having plans to deal with volatility, 
uh, these kind of niche channels and particularly different segments that maybe you haven't focused on become a really interesting opportunity for people. Because if you're working with someone like Reynolds United, you do have access to these channels that are really specialized, particularly I'm bullish on these like mid and long-term stay channels yeah. right now. Um, because at the end of the day, when you don't know how things are going to go in the future, they are like a hedge. If you think of your portfolio, like a stock portfolio, you probably have some really high risk stuff, some pretty low, uh, you know, medium risk stuff that relates to your strategy. In my opinion, long-term stays are kind of like bonds. You know, you're probably going to give up some revenue if things are really good, but um, they they give you a level of stability to try and willingness to try more things with your higher risk parts of your portfolio. And so if we're expecting a lot of volatility, uh, it may be a good idea to look into how you can either leverage through your revenue channel, like your revenue strategies or your channels, utilizing some of these specific channels to maybe include some of that segment in your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that. let's talk about why we're talking about this, Doug. Uh, what have you been seeing lately that kind of makes this a, a topic of conversation for you? Yeah, I think for me, the, the main part of the topic, the reason for the topic of conversation that is that has happened for me is like, I just have heard a lot of people, you know, I mean, granted, it's been two conferences I've had, and I've, I've talked to several clients, large and small, but there is this, this weird aura and feeling um, that things are just so good and everything is great. Um, and I guess what I've been seeing lately is, is, uh, things in, with regards to, you know, COVID, um, as well as travel, um, both, both, uh, in the space, but then also personally, I mean, I had, um, I was, uh, went to the streamline summit conference and, you know, a bunch of my team was supposed to hopefully be able to come, but only one could come because they only ones that had a U.S. passport. So, I mean, there's, there's been a consideration of international travel into the U.S. that has been a factor and an impact to it. Um, and so I think some of those aspects of those things are like, maybe they're not super big, impactful things right this second, but I feel like those have potentials to lure people into, you know, they have the potential to become something that will be a, a really relevant thing that impacts everybody's business. And the thought for me goes, things have been great. Things have been good, but there's always that what if, and, and I think everybody needs to make sure that they're planning and being, being, um, thoughtful of a contingency plan or whatever they can do. I mean, very similar to like what you said, you know, having that recommendation of creating some plans, you know, creating some what if plans when you, when the things are a little bit slower and slowing down a little bit right now, what, what are those, what ifs, what do they look like? And, and what can you assess from those that you can put out of your toolbox or pull out of your toolbox that will actually help you combat it. And I think that's, that's where I've been seeing the most concerns for me is that overall feeling from a lot of people talking about it. Um, I think average booking values have been coming down a little bit from what I've been seeing. Um, I think the windows have been shortening a little bit. Um, I've also seen uh, a few movements in, in terms of um, ADR have gone down and, and I, I know it's going into a slower season, um, but I don't feel like what I've seen has been indicating that it should have been going down as much as it has. Um, and so that's where I'm, I'm kind of starting to get a little concerned, um, that, you know, some clients are missing out on opportunities because maybe, maybe the market is, is starting to say I, it's too expensive. I'm not going to travel. I don't want to deal with that. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. I mean, rental car prices are through the roof right now. So a lot of domestic travel has been not doing on flights, but has been drive to locations. And a lot of people have been renting cars and I mean, they're through the roof. And so some people are saying, man, maybe not. So that's, that's where I know it's a lot of kind of feeling kind of based stuff, but it's just the aggregate of talking to people in person at conferences, as well as on calls and, and just seeing a few things there that just are seeing like, we need to consider this so that everybody isn't caught off guard. Yeah, there's been a few. So I'll give you a few specific examples. Uh, I'm kind of an urban specialist. I work with people in all kind of segments, but um, I've worked pretty closely with some portfolios uh, over the last, you know, over the summer and the fall, um, particularly in like Miami and Dallas and Nashville. And I think what's interesting about these markets is Miami um, has been a market that like has been super hot. And normally like June, July, August would have been considered like a, a shoulder to even low season, but it maintained yeah. like high season rates all the way through. And so people kind of got into this habit where they were like, this is kind of what we can expect going forward. And towards the end of August, we really saw across that market, particularly on the urban side, like a dramatic reduction in both ADR and occupancy. Weekday occupancies crashed and ADRs across the board came down super rapidly. So that was a surprise to a lot of our clients, right? They were like, oh, we really didn't budget for that. 
Um, yeah. But it's one of those things where nothing in the past would have indicated what would happen for that month right now. Uh, traditionally, those were low seasons, but the recent past was not operating that way. So everyone kind of knew it was probably coming, but nobody knew when. And that's a kind of volatility that you want to have a contingency for. Like, hey, if this doesn't continue, what do we do? Um, the alternate side is kind of like Dallas or Nashville. Um, different markets for sure, but kind of similar seasonality. October is kind of like a high season traditionally for them. And so they've been kind of, you know, doing okay through the summer. And there's kind of this expectation that like things are going to really start to pick up for the fall. And it came on a lot slower than we, than we were kind of expecting, right? And it hasn't quite gone up to the level that it was pre-COVID. And so that's a level of volatility here. It's like, we kind of think that this is still going to be a high season. Travel looks really strong, but you got to look at all these other factors that are going on. Are people traveling as much? Is international travel uh, affecting this? Is the COVID situation this year which is different than last year, is that affecting um, traveler sentiment as well? You don't really know the answer to these questions. So really the best way to approach it is if you can ask a question that has no clear answer that you know would affect your bottom line, um, start thinking through some of the potential things that could happen so that you can prepare yourself and prepare your company and prepare your partners about what could happen and what you're gonna do in that case. Because you're putting, you know, none of us are gonna have all the answers. No. But if you're preparing those people you work with that you've at least thought through some of these things, you're going to put yourself in a much better position of trust. You know, one of the things I've noticed in a couple of markets is that um, they've said to me things like, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas were really strong last year. Why is the rate being recommended lower uh, this year? And my answer to that is, well, we've seen a couple of things in some markets. One is that the market is still pricing pretty high, but transactions are coming in lower. Uh, we've started to see in some cases like cancellations are occurring, which, uh, I, you know, one, the booking windows are shorter, shorter than last year. So we're already behind pace as a market. And then two, um, some of these later holiday dates, we're also starting to see cancellations. And so that's impacting the rate. So people want to say like last year was COVID. So I know mm -hmm. that the rate should be here. It doesn't mean that you can't put that that rate out there in the expectation, but you need to be prepared for the fact that like last year was COVID, but it's not the same COVID. We peaked on COVID in January last year, which means we went past these seasons. This year in many markets in the United States, at least the peak COVID in January, like death and hospitalization situations, we're already surpassing that in September. And you got to yeah. ask yourself, one, is that affecting traveler sentiment? Two, it, you know, we don't know if it's going to get worse or better, or people are going to get tired of it, or maybe it'll be balanced out by some of the news we're getting about vaccinated international travel. There's all these factors we don't really know about. And that's really the definition of the volatility we're talking about is yeah. these factors make it difficult to predict what's going to happen based on the data we have in the last couple of weeks and in the last year and in the last two years. And so you need to be prepared to put a strategy out there, but know that if it, if it's not showing up, what are you going to do? Because you can't, once the date passes, you're, you can't do anything about it. It's gone. Yeah. I think, I think the other, the other piece too is, uh, you know, there's two things I wanted to uh, unpack there too, that you said, and I think it's really comes down to relationship management too, right? Whether it's your internal team or your homeowners or however you are operating your business. I mean, put yourself in their shoes, right. For the other person that you're serving or taking care of, like, would you, would you want somebody to just tell you all the time? Yeah, things are great. We're doing great. Everything's great. Everything's fine. Or would you want somebody to say, we're doing really, really great. Everything is great. But I also want to consider this because this is kind of on the radar. This is a uncertainty. Um, and let's, let's, let's create a plan for it. While we're doing so, so well and everything is going really great, let's create some contingency plans because we don't want the bottom to fall out on us. And not that <clears throat> people are necessarily you know, going to the extremes and maxing out what they can do because they're just trying to just grab every bit of inventory and spending all their cash and margin on everything else. It's just more so like, let's just put in some fail safes. Let's put in some things to, to, to take consideration of it. I mean, I think, John, you and I can, can speak with personal experience from how COVID affected our business that we were in working for Stay Alfred at the time. And I mean, what, you know, nobody could have predicted that there was going to be a global pandemic that happened at a certain time that it did and it took that much toll on it. But wouldn't it have been cool to have some kind of a contingency plan already laid out because we were kind of preparing ourselves for certain things, maybe not to that certain degree, but how much better would it have been for us if we had some, you know, emergency contention plan that we were like, okay, 
let's let's apply this and get get off to a better start instead of trying to be like oh my gosh we're on our heels trying to figure out what to do um, and that was the first thing that we did before there was really any lockdowns is when we started to see that this might be a problem, uh, we went through our entire portfolio and built contingency rate plans to implement in response. And I think we had like three levels. We had yeah. three levels of contingency rate plans and strategies about length of stay and what we were going to do uh, with cancellation policy that we were like, if these situations happen, this is what we're going to implement. And we did the same thing kind of for recovery too. So I don't think, yeah. you know, everyone needs to be in that kind of position, but you can no. think to yourself about, you know, I think a good example, because we are dealing with COVID right now. Last year, we kind of, you know, it kind of peaked in January and it kind of killed the next quarter, right? So mm -hmm. if we're kind of peaking right now, um, maybe it's really going to have a similar effect to last spring this winter, which could really right. be a, a problem for people. Um, yeah. But the question then becomes, you know, if we kind of get through that before January, um, maybe it's just as bad. And we, and the similar situation as this year happens where spring still kind of killed, but then the summer is super hot. But what yeah. could also happen is maybe things start to subside a little in January. And that means that seasonality will shift back to a more traditional seasonality, or there'll be an even bigger snapback, depending on how long people are locked down for, you know, where it pushes those seasonalities out. And you need to think to yourself, like, what would I do here? Um, to give you kind of like a direct takeaway, I would say we don't know if COVID's going to peak in the fall and then things will be different for the in January. We don't know if it's going to go all the way through like it did last year and we'll just have a longer COVID season and it will have a huge snapback in the summer. In either of those situations, I think the answer is probably that you should be putting out much higher rates further out and you should be thinking about um, t hedging your volatility with longer term stays through the winter and maybe even into the spring. Um, mm -hmm. and you can start to spin up those channels. Now you don't have to deploy those strategies, but you can be prepared to deploy them. So if you get connected to these mid and long-term stay channels, um, you already know kind of how your rate position is going to be at that point. Then if you decide that, Hey, I think that this is more volatile than we really want it to be. We can go ahead and deploy those strategies. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost kind of like a responsibility thing. You know, I mean, before COVID was a thing in a global pandemic, it was easy to utilize an excuse of like, we've never seen anything like this before. We never, we don't know what it is. Like, we don't know what happened. But now that we've all been through it and a lot of folks have survived and done really well and have capitalized on it, it's almost negligent to not have a contingency plan for when another wave or another peak or something happens almost. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like, now we know what kind of happened and what could happen. So how do we apply that going forward? And I think you you articulate that really well as far as having different type of rate strategies set for different different situations that happens. Yeah. I mean, create those so that you can almost have that proverbial playbook that you bring out, and it's like, okay, guys, the, here we go. This is what we're going to do now because what we've what we've seen. Now the next question or the other piece I wanted to unpack was kind of like, you know, well, how how does somebody know when the moment is to do that? You know, or how it is. I mean, you can there's a lot of different things you can look at with regards to your own data and, and trending and performance. But I think you could also consider if you have connections to, you know, great companies like wheelhouse that, that can provide you some of that insights. Um, I know that uh, some of the other data players in the game have some really good data market data that can actually help you see some things maybe that can influence when you should deploy certain, you know, strategies or resources, but you can even do a couple things on your own. Like I, I did it for myself, but you know, it doesn't give you a full exact picture, but it does help a little bit, which is uh, TSA. You know, how many people are actually traveling through the airports and are doing checkpoints? I mean, it's an interesting thing to look at that helps you to see is flight travel down because we know that flight travel does have some impact on destinations in certain places. And so it's kind of interesting to see on a domestic standpoint of like comparing, you know, right now versus 2020 and right now versus 2019 to see if those variances are kind of equating each, each other or going down or how that's working, that might be some of those kind of indicators. Um, it'd be interesting to have your input too, John, on what you think would be some other additional indicators that may not be just related to somebody's individual, you know, performance. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to do. And that's the point of the volatility. What I have suggested to folks, particularly around like the Thanksgiving, Christmas kind of period this year, that seems, in my opinion, to be pretty volatile. We've seen our prices start to come down because we're, you know, our algorithm at Wheelhouse is seeing that we're a little behind in a number of locations. Um, but people don't always want to do that. And we also know that there was a trend where like short-term bookings were, were, have been strong over the summer. 
we don't know if that's going to happen if, if things, you know, if people get a little cagey about traveling. But what I would say is what you can do is you can go ahead and implement what you think the rate should be. But set, if you're going to put your own strategy and then use like these tools, either through Wheelhouse or Data Studio or any of this as a reference, um, set a drop dead date for yourself. And what I mean by that is it's like, hey, I think the rate, you know, Wheelhouse is saying that the rate should be $400 over Thanksgiving. I think it should be $600. But if I get within three weeks and I'm not seeing bookings in my portfolio, I'm going to I'm going to revert to a different strategy. And so yeah. you can set drop dead dates for yourself. You can put them on your Google calendar. You can tell other people. And they're just like reminders to like, whatever I'm doing, this is what I need to be concerned. And I would say do that for the spring too. You know, maybe we want to put higher rates out further out because we think things are going to recover. But you're like, hey, if I'm not seeing any bookings within 45 days, I need to change the strategy or within yeah. 60 days. Or maybe it's the opposite. It's like, you know, I want to make sure that I check March, April, and May in January, February, and March for booking activity. And then that's when I need to make a decision. You may not even know exactly what that decision is, but you can set time periods that kind of correlate to what you've learned this year or from pre-COVID in terms of your booking window situation and use, generate your own lead indicators based on that. Um, because it's like, I think that's going to be really helpful for folks. It's almost like saving you from yourself kind of thing, right? It's kind of like find, find, a, find a, a, a barrier or some walls that you can put around yourself and say, hey, this, this, and this, these are, these are uh, uh, stepping stones of where we're going to stop things. And we're going to go back to doing something because it's, it's almost like AB testing on certain things. Like I'm going to test this rate. I'm going to test this strategy, but I'm going to give myself a timeline and say, Hey, look, I, I don't care what I personally feel. We set up, we set a, a timeline and agreement and we hit it. And now we need to do something different because it's not getting there. And I think that that probably helps people probably feel a little more comfortable too and confident in what's going on when, when volatility really, really kind of comes into play. Um, totally. Talk to yourself in the future. Say like, yeah. <laughs> hey, right now, I don't know what the spring is going to look like. And I have no confidence that's going to look like pre-COVID or 2021. So I don't know what it is. So what I want to yeah. do is tell myself to look at it in December or January or February, depending on what your yeah. portfolio makeup is. And just remind yourself that you didn't know now remind yourself what you did. Maybe the answer was like, I put the rates up 20% because we knew that short-term bookings, you know, bookings in the short term were pushing rates up and I want to be prepared to capture that. But after we get the next three or four months of data, you may decide at that time that maybe that strategy isn't what you want to hold out for them. Yeah. So let me ask, uh, let me ask you this question, John. So um, this past Monday, um, the uh, Biden administration announced the, the plan to open up uh, international travel uh, in November. Um, they, haven't, they haven't given a specific date yet in November, um, but they're gonna open up travel for international uh, travelers uh, into the US in, in November. Um, I've, I've, wa I've read the article, there's a BBC article on it. There's a Washington Post article on it. So folks out there listening, go, go look it up and, and take a look at it. It's really interesting stuff. Um, maybe we'll even put it in the comments of the post when we post this video out there, but realistically, I mean, the, the data, the things that the restrictions that are showing is basically like, you have to have, uh, foreign nationals, you know, are required to be fully vaccinated in order to get into the U S um, uh, everybody else has got to demonstrate proof of a vaccination before flying, or they have to obtain a negative test result within three days of traveling. Um, and, uh, they also have to provide some contact information because there's going to be a requirement, I think of some contact tracing, um, and then, um, but they won't be required to, to quarantine. And the only exceptions are going to be for children who are not eligible to get a vaccine yet. Um, but Americans who are fully vaccinated will just need to be tested before traveling. And then also after they arrive into the U S. Um, so kind of those things considered like John, what, what's your, what's your opinion or your thought? Like, do you think, do you think from some of that, that information or whatever, that that's going to really uh, impact uh, the space that much? And if so, like where, or what do you think? Um, I absolutely think it's going to impact the space. That Washington Post article is very good, actually. Yeah. Uh, I recommend folks read it. Um, I kind of agree with a number of, of points in it, which is that um, this goes along with some things I know, too. I know a lot of South American markets are slating. They're going into summer and they're slating to, to lift their restrictions. That means that people can travel there, but I also think the people with money will leave if they have the opportunity to um, and get somewhere else because they've been under lockdowns for a long time. Um, mm. I, so I think that, that people are going to come to the United States. 
What I want to caution people on is that it's going to be a very uneven, you know, people from other countries aren't just going to go everywhere in America. There's a lot of destinations that have been really strong because of domestic travel that aren't well known. So I would expect that areas that pre-COVID were really well known in the international community for places to go are going to be the ones to benefit from this. Urban environments will probably be the ones to benefit. But if you don't have a history in your market of getting lots of international travel, I would not say, I would not expect it yeah. um, to affect you, uh, especially immediately. It'll probably bleed in. And this is one of those hard things where like, we'll say this is going to be a benefit to travel. But where the volatility comes in is, we don't know what's going to change with domestic travel because people are afraid of going to COVID. There may be restrictions in certain areas. And so that creates volatility because you have these different things that when taken alone, you can probably assess, but we don't know how to correlate them to each other. Yeah. So I think when they're all put that, together, we don't know if it's going to be a net gain or a net loss. Didn't mean to cut you. Yeah. Back. No, no, you're good. Um, I, that's super, super good in my opinion. And I also think the, one of the things I really liked about that, that Washington post article is, um, they took some perspectives from a few different, uh, experts in the space, right. And it was some hotel stuff or some travel tourism stuff. And, and I think one of the, the, the really, really cool points that I saw in there was, um, first and foremost, they, they reported the national travel and tourism office reported that in 2018, the United States saw 79.3 million international arrivals. And last year, that number dropped down to 19.4 million. And so there was, a, there, was a, there was a perspective and consideration that said, well, how much was the impact? And they were, they actually, the, one, of the, one of the guys, I forget what his name is, but he, he actually said that only 6% of that travel was actually kind of really, really hitting um, really, really relevantly to the, to the tourism space within, within regards to what was going on in terms of night stays. And the other part that I really, really liked is that this might be, in my opinion, a, um, a really good lift and a much needed lift that the urban locations have been really dying for, um, specifically in the Northeast, like New York's, Boston's, Washington, DC, that kind of stuff. Now that European traveler or business person can actually get in person to some of these places that they had been historically able to do for business. So it might be a really good lift in the space for some of those urban markets um, with regards to international travel. But the other speculation that I kind of hinted at a little bit in the beginning was that, you know, rental car prices are going through the roof so that the, you know, those surf and ski destination spots may not see any big lift at all from the international travel that it might be mostly just focused on the, on the urban and that the d domestic flights aren't going to go up or anything super huge, but the, the travel and the, the car driving and stuff will be still be a, a big cause. But if rental car prices don't go down, like, I mean, it, it could, could be a deterrent as well. So, um, they, yeah. they did, they did recommend that article, something about, you know, looking out for, you know, undiscovered destination places and cities to, to be on the upward move, movement. Um, I even talked to a, a client in, um, at the streamline conference that had a bunch of properties in Sedona, uh, Arizona, and they were, they, they basically started their business in January, right before COVID started had 10 properties, and then they had to go down to five. And then just recently they like tripled their inventory and they're getting such like a ton of travel that's coming out to Sedona that, that is just, it was huge for them. So, I mean, that might be an undiscovered kind of location that might be on the trend up or something. Yeah, I would think that my guess on this, uh, and there's kind of two things I want to bring up, but more related to what you were speaking about, um, I would expect that the international travel uh, will be correlated with a longer booking window. I mean, it's a lot of work mm -hmm. on a trip. And so if you're a vacation destination, um, we may start seeing people like particularly like ski destinations that are really well known in the international community. I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see, you know, that actually mitigate some of the things we're seeing from the domestic side, which is cancellations, a little bit of uncertainty around COVID and restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. And that could be very good for folks. What I would suggest is that I wouldn't be surprised if people really plan a lot of springtime trips, particularly in springtime high markets. And so what we've seen is people aren't really, you know, because of what's gone on in the last couple of years, those prices may be uh, also kind of undervalued right now. Um, so I would suggest if you're like in the South um, have and have traditionally a strong like March, 
uh, with these kind of announcements, um, particularly if you're in a market that gets a lot of international travel, maybe put your springtime rates up higher than the market. Um, if you've got a really top quality product, you can book those. Maybe uh, if your product maybe isn't as great of a performer, you can leave it more at market level. But you still have time to adjust if things are volatile and still make good revenue. But I think with this kind of announcement, you are at risk of maybe underselling your product um, because those people will, you know, they may not be prepared to travel. They may not be interested in traveling during December, um, but they may be planning a trip for January, February, March, particularly if you're like in Florida or Georgia or something. Yeah. Especially if your destinations are nearby, like an international like airport, you know, a really good, really good hotspot. And that was one of the things in that article too, talked about is it, they speculated, uh, I think it was the guy from Hopper was speculating that there'd be more flights um, that would be be released going international into the U.S. base. I mean, if you have an airport that's international base and has seen a downside in number of flights coming from you know international, you might see an increase in that. And like you said, John, it might be might be worth that you may be underselling it in the springtime or in those high, highly desired timeframes because you might you might get a lot more travelers potentially planning that farther out. Yeah. And you may get, depending on how things go domestically with COVID, there may be even more demand within a window that we can't anticipate now. Now, the other thing I want to bring up that adds to this volatility that I think people need to keep in mind, not everyone, because it doesn't apply to everyone, but um, particularly these urban environments where uh, the international travel may really help. You also have to consider that like our supply denominator is, is volatile. So hotels really wound down um, last yeah. year. They did not stabilize near as well as our, our side of the industry and hospitality did. But um, we do have to be aware that they will be revving their inventory back up and they have a lot yeah. of money that they need. To, they have a lot of fixed costs. They have a lot of money that they need to make up for. And that can have an impact on the pricing because if we see these hotels really start to spin up, have the labor to be able to handle the volume. Um, if they're part of these big flags, they may actually be able to influence where people travel to. Uh, there's the potential there that that could affect the demand for your product in a way that's hard to anticipate. You know, if you like in New York, there's tons of hotel rooms in New York. And if a bunch of them just kind of close down their operations to save all the money on the fixed cost because of occupancy was so low is they start to rev up. Um, that demand that would push your rate up may do weird things over time. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that's what they said in that article is that ironically, even though this demand is going to be higher, it'll probably drop airline prices initially because they'll start doing more flights. And I think that that's yeah. something we have to consider as well is if you're just going to hold your rate high because you're like, well, there's going to be more travelers, more international. If you're not seeing the bookings, you need to consider there may be other factors that are impacting this uh, ecosystem. Um, and that's where having that contingency, being aware and being honest with yourself about the volatility will put you in a better position to just react to whatever the market conditions are. Yeah. I think the biggest, biggest thing I heard you say out of there is that the, uh, the hotel industry is just waiting for an opportunity to get back into essentially, you know, taking, taking our lunch, so to speak <laughs> from the VR space. And they're waiting yeah. for that opportunity. And that, we've that, had all this, the lunch. This, this, yeah, we've had all the lunch. It's been so good. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think with the international ban restriction, that could really help the hotel industry try to gain some of that back. That's a really good perspective. I didn't even think about that, John. That's a really good one. Yeah. But, I mean, the supply side is really, that's an element of volatility that's, it's hard to be aware of, but it definitely has an impact. Um, and then on top of that, I think, you know, if we're going to talk about things that we should talk about, I would really like to touch on before we run out of time today that, yeah. you know, whether it's talking to your owners or your partners or your executive team is do some education right now up front as things start to slow down. Give them, you know, you can go on uh, Reynolds United Data Studio. You can use the market trends in Wheelhouse. You can use our insights into the specific model, but pull together some analysis. Maybe you do just one for a market or one for a type. You don't need to do everything individually, but say like, hey, you know, give these people some information about like, this is how 19 to 20 changed. This is how 20 to 21 was different. And then give them some notes about like, these are some things that could happen in 2022. And this is how we would approach it. And send that information out to people. I mean, if you're in a market area, maybe you, you know, you don't have to do everything for each individual home. You can give them a higher level market trend. Uh, Wheelhouse yeah. has a great, like, uh, I like to use RevPAR occupancy uh, monthly for the, 
it shows multiple years. Um, those are really good because you can give them the data, you can annotate it a little bit, and then give them an idea of what they're going to do or what they might expect. And that's going to, I think, particularly for people with owners and owners that maybe are not as engaged or not as into the revenue side, it's going to give them a lot more tolerance for things changing. Because what you risk mm -hmm. is an owner is like, you're not producing what we did last year. And for them in their head, they're like, well, I'm just going to go find uh, a manager who says that they're going to do better than last year. That manager is still going to produce whatever the market is, but you're going to lose that yep. owner. And that owner is still not going to be happy because if everyone's kind of, if the market is the way it is, nobody's really going to change that. But just passing the buck, that's all that's yeah. happening with that. But in their idea, in their head, they're thinking like, I just, you know, this, this team is screwing it up. I'm going to go to the team that's telling me they're going to do better. And then and you're going to have to wait another year to come back to them. It's still going to be hard because there's inertia involved. If you've come to them ahead of time, explain to them um, some of the market volatility so that they expect it. I think many owners, just by doing that up front uh, and executive teams, they just have more tolerance because you're telling them there's volatility. You're giving them a roadmap for what you would do. And you're opening up those lines of communication. And I think people will be, you know, you'll have less of the like, you're not doing what you did last year. I'm going to find another manager who who will, and more of the okay. I can understand what's going on. They feel like they're involved in the situation, and you mm -hmm. can you kind of you know re-engaging them as a partner uh, to have that conversation. And I think it's not hard to get to that data. You can use Wheelhouse Air DNA, um, pull this trend data. Maybe just make a few general reports that cover the market because you're really just trying to touch on high level trends, and you can send that out to all your owners. Yeah, I think. I think a really, really interesting part about what you just said there is there, there is definitely some granular detailed things that you can do, like you mentioned, and there's also some really high level stuff you can do that you were kind of getting at. And I think it can be as simply put as communicating with your internal teams or your homeowners and saying, here's what we know, and here's what we don't know. And just by signaling the things that you don't know, that might spark the conversation or at least the thought process in your homeowner and your staff's mind to say, wow, we don't know these things. So that in itself is becomes like a trigger or an, 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 an alert, so to speak, to be on the lookout and have everybody thinking about the things that we don't know and seeing well, what, what we don't know could become something. And when you do that, everybody starts to not have, you know, be caught off guard. I mean, I think the one thing I can safely say that I've been dealing with since being with a year with, you know, Reynolds United away from my silo of Jeff Stay Alfred times has been that, you know, the homeowner landscape of, you know, property management, there isn't a homeowner out there who has a property management company work, you know, with them or, or do their, do their product that has been like, yeah, I don't care what you do. Just do it. Just make, you know, whatever money I get is a little extra. I mean, that, that really doesn't exist that much in this space. There isn't somebody who says I've got 25 homes. Yeah. Yeah. Just do whatever you want with it. I don't care. It's fine. You know, there's not a person out there like that whether it is somebody who's micromanaging it or there's somebody who is like checking in every quarter or whatever, there's still an emphasis to care about what's happening with that business. And so if you bring it to their attention in a way that says, this is what we know, and this is what we don't know. And here's some contingency plans. Here's some things for those things we don't know that prepares them mentally. And in that situation where you mentioned somebody could potentially go, well, I'm going to go over to this property management company because you guys aren't blah, 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 blah at least at least before they get to that point, they know and say, hey, these guys are telling me what I know and what I don't know. And they have contingency, contingency plans and I can actually work with them on it and try to figure it out. Because I think that's what most of those homeowners want is they want to be uh, in, the, in the know and they want to have the transparency of what's happening. They don't want to necessarily, yeah. all of them want to be totally in, you know, but sometimes they, they just want to, they want to have a little bit of transparency in what's happening and not just think everything is all just gravy and everything's good. Yeah. I mean, trust and tolerance are correlated. If we use the example yes. of like um, Christmas or New Year's um, in like a ski market, you know, what you're telling people might be that, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to try to hold the rate and do better than last year. These are some factors that, that we don't know what the impact will be and may cause, you know, if these factors happen, it could actually cause us to book shorter uh, notice to book at a lower rate. And we just want you to be prepared for that. So this is what we're doing. This is what could happen. And by doing that ahead of time, 
whatever happens, they'll at least have been prepared for. Whereas if they're having that conversation with you after the fact, it's really hard to, to climb that hill when they're like, you booked this for less than last year. What the heck? Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. there were all these factors. You basically, it, you never get away from sounding like you're just making excuses. If you do it ahead of time, it, it's a totally different environment. I mean, you know, if someone comes to you and says like, hey, these things might happen. I just wanted you to be prepared. This is what we're going to try to do though. And this is what we think we can do. Then there, there's just a lot more tolerance to... Yeah slow down and, tr and try to understand because you've been prepared for it. You know, nobody wants to be caught on by surprise. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I think, awesome. I think we're, we're just about out of time, but obviously we changed things up today. So we have a, uh, a joke KPI that we'll finish things out with. So I want to hear it, John. This thing's awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is a great joke KPI. We know you've been waiting, just hoping we'll get through whatever we're talking about so we can tell you the joke KPI, a little icing on the cake. This is actually a KPI that we did develop at Stay Alfred, both kind of as a joke, but it, it kind of did work. Um, and it's called the Taylor Swift Demand Index. <laughs> and the Taylor Swift Demand Index is the proportion of search volume on Google Trends between an upcoming event and Taylor Swift. And it's used to determine, to determine whether an event is likely to sell out in a specific region based on the assumption that Taylor Swift concerts always sell out. So what we would do <laughs> is we'd go on Google Trends and when we're looking up conferences or concerts and stuff, we would look in that region, we would pull up Taylor Swift and their search uh, quantity, and we would pull up that event and the relationship, the proportion between them and Taylor Swift, you know, it would determine whether or not we wanted to preemptively raise rates, if we wanted to let the demand show up in our portfolio and then react to it, or if we didn't think it was going to actually impact us at all. Because, you know, if it was one or more Taylor Swift and search uh, potential, then we were pretty confident that it was going to be a sellout in the market and that we could preemptively raise the rate. <laughs> I think I think we just I think we need to shorten it and we just call it T swizzle the T swizzle effect. <laughs> yeah, the, I think uh, our staff called it the the T Swift constant. <laughs> T Swift constant. <laughs> um, Very constant. Well, this was an awesome conversation. I hope everyone yeah. enjoyed it. Um, Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you are and what you're doing, and I'll follow up, and then we can sign off for today. Yeah, so uh, I'm Doug. I'm, I'm the head of revenue success at Reynolds United. Reynolds United is a channel manager by trade, by by uh, by core and definition of what it's been doing in the in the past and built on. Um, but revenue success is a relatively new thing for the company, and uh, I've built a series of products in RDA Data Studio and just trying to help provide more um, more opportunities for clients to be better converting on channels and get more bookings uh, by having insights and transparency and and just really trying to help influence better, better conversion and overall uh, performance out of their distribution strategies. So that is me. And uh, thank you guys uh, for always listening and watching if you get this far in the uh, podcast. Yeah. And my name is John DeRolay. I'm the head of enterprise sales at Wheelhouse, uh, also a resident kind of revenue management expert. If you haven't heard of Wheelhouse, we're a dynamic pricing and revenue management platform. We do everything from using our deep data science with the research published uh, on our website for you to access to determine the best market-based pricing for you every single day. Uh, we've also created a platform which makes it extremely easy and efficient to interact with your rates and portfolio and is perfect for high-touch revenue managers. So if you're interested interested or in need or just considering um, what options are out there for pricing, hit me up. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. And uh, have a great rest of the week. Thanks so much.